As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand, and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So last week we looked at uh, the character of Saul, and if you remember, um, I asked a question about Gamaliel. And I'd long since thought that Gamaliel was just a person. It was a name of a person. And what I found out was that Gamaliel is actually a title. And he was a head Pharisee that Saul was trained under when he came to Jerusalem. Some believe later on in his life. And my question was, how was it that Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5 defended the apostles, stopped them from being murdered, by the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and then at chapter 7 and also in chapter 9, it appears as though he is for, or at least allows Paul or Saul to go to the high priest and get letters to be able to persecute Christians in the surrounding villages. Well, you remember I kind of dug around uh, last week and... Uh, <laughs> And I found a few things like, for instance, that it was a title and I couldn't find out anything more. Well, would you believe that this week, as part of our reading assignment, so you, you see how big this book is. What would be the chances that this week I would pick the book up and in a separate box, there it's got, who is Gamaliel? Now, it doesn't answer all the questions, but it answers one. Um, give me that thing there, Don. Just click on that for me. There we go. So it says here, right? When Rabbi Gamaliel the elder died, the glory of the Lord ceased and purity and abstinence died. It's probably not going to mean a lot to you, but they mourned and recognized, the Jewish scholars recognized, that when Gamaliel the elder passed away, that Judea quickly fell badly. So I'm still of the opinion that right in between chapter 5 and possibly 7 when they stoned Stephen, and we looked at the trial between the Sanhedrin and Stephen and how he defended himself and in the end said, hey, you guys are the ones that are in error. You guys are the ones that blaspheme the law and the tabernacle and the temple itself. And, the, and I believe that maybe Gamaliel the elder passed away at that point and his son, or son-in-law they say, took over right in between that point. And that was God's hand of protection taken away from Israel. And we see what took place from that time. And I tell you that not because of the information, but I tell you this to say that, that God, when you follow him, when you have a working, living relationship with him, he is interested in the, in the details of your life. I mean, what are the chances that I would come across that at that point? And you might say, well, that's a bit of a near miss, isn't it? Shouldn't it have been last week that you saw that? And I would say, no, because it's not about me, because this is not important about me. Actually, the people here, or were here last week, were witnessing that event, right? And now you can see, hey, wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. I think it is. Do you not think it is? Praise yeah. God. And he is, he is interested in 
the very details of our lives if we give him room and if we recognize the way his hand is in everything, right? Praise God. So, just witnessing a faith journey as a bystander is, is, so, is so amazing and we're going to look a little bit about that. And I'm, I'm just going to say this is, my, this, is a, this is a kind of crossbreed version, ESV and New King James Version. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. That's the assurance that, that God gives you when you strive for something, ultimately salvation, right? Assurance. The evidence of things not seen. What is the not seen? Is God's hand in your life. The evidence. This, this week, just another underlining of how God gives us evidence of the unseen realm that he operates in. And that we, by default, being born again, are in the spiritual dimension with him. Praise God. Definition of faith. Definition of faith. Okay. So here we are then, Acts, we're back in the book of Acts, we're with Saul, he's on the way to um, Damascus. We saw the character of Saul last week, and that he knew Jesus of Nazareth. In his own words, he says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And he was driven like we saw, to destroy the church. He imprisoned many of them. He murdered them. He hounded those that were hiding, men and women, those belonging to what they started to call the way. The way. That's wonderful, isn't it? I've seen t-shirts recently. The way. I belong to the way. Wow. Uh, so here, we join Saul on his journey in, in verse 3. It says, now he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. Shone around him. And it got me thinking, what does that look like? Like, I love to look at the old uh, pictures and reliefs and artist impressions of biblical stories. We've had it for a long time. There's been thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of artists that have looked at the biblical accounts that have been inspired by them, that have been moved by them and sought to try to put it into a picture, right? I'm a very visual person. I love to see things visually, um, probably because of my building background. But here's one version. You can see the light coming down on top of, obviously, the character Saul there. Um, there's a few things that are probably wrong with this. There was probably unlikely to be a, a Roman centurion in the background there. Um, also, the clothing. Now that we've started to dig into the different sects of the Jews, we knew that the Pharisees wore, what did they wear? They didn't, they didn't wear, the Sadducees wore purple and red and all the rest of it. Do you remember that, the Sadducees? But here, uh, they would have wore black. Right? Black and white was their very particular way to dress. So that picture's a little bit skewed. Here's another one. Here's one that's looking more into the unseen realm. I like this picture. You can see the light coming down, hitting uh, Saul there on the floor. But here you can see that Saul looks very old. I mean, I dare say he looks kind of 60s. Not the case. I was definitely... I'm sorry. I mean, hey, I'm almost there, so... <laughs> He looks older, let's just say that, he's got a grey beard. Um, probably not. Uh, we know um, he was born around about 5 to 10 um, AD. And we also know that I found out this week that, um, that the, Jewish, um, the Jewish, the way that they have their rite of passage, as you would call it, by the time a man got to 30, he would have been able to um, have a place of authority. So within, within uh, the church or within the, the synagogue. So we know he must have been 30 at least. And I think, Al, oh, isn't that fair to say? He's probably between 30 or 40 at this point. So he's a young man, right? He, he is a young man. Let's have a look at this one. This is another one. This is kind of odd looking. It almost looks like there's kind of raindrops coming down on top of him. And obviously the artist, uh, didn't understand that, hey, this isn't... And if you just looked at this picture, you would think, hey, this is like 
Knights of the Templar, right? The Knights of Christ. <laughs> this is like Middle Ages, so they're a little bit skewed with their thinking there and depicting this, so that we would have to give that one a there. This one I thought was good, okay, and we're going to see why, but this is a very solitary experience that Saul is having now, and we know that coming into the presence of God, you're not really thinking about anything other than getting on the ground, right? So, very interesting picture there, and we know, I think this one is, is probably one of the better ones. In that when we remember, the verse actually says that the light from heaven shone around him. So the other ones kind of show this beam of light coming down. It must have kind of enveloped him almost down on the ground. Anyway, kind of interesting to see that. So in Acts uh, 9, 4 then, it says, falling to the ground. He can't help it. He's put on his ground. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Uh, and he replies, or it adds, I'm sorry, it adds this part. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks or goads. King James Version says pricks. New King James Version is goads. And these are part of the family called the received text. Um, and what's going on here is Luke is actually quoting a Greek proverb. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. A goad is an agricultural piece of equipment that they put. Um, it's, a, it's a metal spike that is sharpened that's on the end of a stick that when the oxen is moving, they can either hurry it up by pricking it in, in I guess, the back or the, the, the rear leg maybe. Um, and it can also steer the, the oxen too. So the proverb is, you know, a proverb is just a kind of saying, isn't it? It's a kind of pithy saying. It means, hey, don't kick against the go. Don't kick against the stick. And it's because the, sometimes the oxen would kick against that with irritation and that it would be driven further into its flesh and it would hurt it. So Luke, when he's giving this account, and it's interesting that the other versions don't include that part of the verse, but it's actually saying, hey, this is going to hurt you if you continue to resist my steering, right? This is what the, the text is trying to convey, I think, in that term. Jesus is telling him in no uncertain terms that if he continues to resist God, it's going to be painful. And then in an almost command, uh, Jesus tells him, but rise, enter the city, and you will be told what to do. There's no negotiation there. He's just telling him, hey... That's it, you're, you're, you're going now, and you're going to wait to be done. Now look at this. This is in an English newspaper, it's called The Independent. It's not very independent at all, but it says, St. Paul's famous revelation may have been caused by an epileptic fit, said he scientist. <laughs> Interesting. It's very disingenuous, and the, the subtitle goes on to say that they were scanning the brain of a man who had both a seizure and a vision of God at the same time. So, whatever, they obviously have taken that and tried to paint a story that maybe Paul or Saul was having a seizure, that he didn't encounter Jesus of Nazareth at all. Um, and from the title, a lot of people would just read the title and take that away. I think if you were uh, anti-Christian anyway, that will be enough for you to just confirm that, you know, that it's madness. Now you might say, hey, doesn't that remind us of uh, Matthew 17 when the demonic boy comes to Jesus? You remember the disciples tried to uh, evict this spirit and they weren't able to do it and the, the parents bring the boy, and here in the New King James Version, it says, Have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely and often falls into the fire and into the water. But the, the, uh, the Greek word there, the, 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 the New King James uses epileptic. It's interesting that the King James actually puts 
um, seizure. But both of them are slightly off. The Greek there is actually a phrase called moonstruck. And that's why the King James leans towards, um, uh, sorry, the King James actually says a lunatic, I'm sorry. Uh, and it comes from the Latin, which is luna, which means moon, moonstruck, which means to be just held in, in, in awe, I guess. You're, you're arrested, moonstruck. But, but really, um, I think we need to be careful when we read something like this, even seizure, because what we do is take our modern interpretation of that word, or the usage of that word, and we put it there, and we then get, there's a confusion between, well, is it saying that he was an epileptic? No, I don't think he did. I think there is something about a state of altered consciousness that a spiritual experience can have on you. But I think it was difficult for all the um, interpreters to really find the right word, moonstruck. It wouldn't mean a lot to us in the English, but it just means to be completely arrested and transfixed by that situation. But back to this idea of the epileptic fit and this argument then, so was Saul just, you know, had a seizure and, and we can write this all off uh, and, and today we can just give someone a pill to sort all that out. We've got to remember in context here that there were witnesses, right? And look here, Luke even records that the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. So they knew something had happened. This wasn't an isolated event. With Saul, he wasn't having a seizure. And it reminds us also of his account later on when he's in front of a gripper, when he says, there were with me, there were those that were with me, saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And it made me think then uh, of the words, um, you know, these, these bystanders are hearing something. They saw the light, they heard something, but they didn't recognize it. They didn't know what it was. Um, when Jesus was on the cross in John 12, we have the same thing again. Bystanders looking at an event that was taking place, a supernatural event, they heard something, but they weren't sure what it was. Look here, it says, some thought it had thundered. And some said, no, an angel had spoken um, to, to Jesus at that time. And it, it makes us think then, is it just happenstance that we could miss the most important thing that could ever happen to us? Is it just a piece of faulty hearing that could determine whether or not you are saved or not? It says hear, right? The word is hearing. Jesus says, my sheep, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. But we're not talking about just hearing, right? We're not talking about the eardrum vibrating. And for us recognizing something audible from that. You know, we could use the better, the Greek word akua there, we could better say heed. It's an old word, heed. And the new NLT says, my sheep listen to my voice. So it's not that they didn't understand it, rather, maybe they did, but they didn't put it into action. Right, hearing here, as Jesus is talking about here, hearing is not just that you hear a, a voice or a command or something, but rather that you put it into action, right? You're obedient. That's what he's getting at here. So the voice, uh, sorry, the, so the, um, the sign outside this week says, do you recognize his voice? Do we recognize his voice during the day? Because the Lord is constantly talking to us. Constantly. If we belong to him, he's always go goading us to bring us into a closer, more intimate relationship with him. 
And that is about obedience. That sharpens our hearing, right? Sharpens our ability to hear the more softly spoken commands to us. Maybe the commands that we don't want to hear. Maybe the commands that sometimes will be uncomfortable for us, right? This is a development of being able to hear and recognize his voice. But what if you're a bystander? Maybe you're listening online and you're saying, well, I don't know, but I don't know. I don't think I know the Lord, but I do know someone that is a Christian. Maybe they've become a Christian recently. Maybe you've watched them from a distance. Maybe you've seen a transformation in that person, the peace that they have, the softening that they've become to experience. You know, Sarah phoned, phoned me up this week and she said, you never guessed the phone call that I just received. It was from someone that we knew, the wife of someone that we knew. I met him maybe six or seven years ago now when I first moved down to Glen Cove, down there. And I used to witness to him. I used to talk to him about the Lord. And he used to tease me relentlessly. He used to mock me. But now, this is what his wife said to Sarah this week. She said, I think there's something wrong with my husband. All he does is read the Bible. Praise God. All he does is look at stuff on YouTube about church stuff and God. Do you think he needs counseling? <laughs> and she's on the phone going, please God. So, you know, for her, the experience is something happened to her husband. And she's watching him change. And she can't make sense of it. She thinks he needs counseling. But praise God, he's being transformed, right? All he does is read the Bible. Well, isn't that amazing? Because what happens when you read the Bible? Be transformed with the renewing of your mind, right? Romans 12. Praise God. So that was, again, another bystander situation where it was like, wow, this is just awesome. No, he doesn't need counseling. And he's commending. <laughs> anyway, we're probably going to get into a situation where she will be counseled to help her understand that what is going on with her husband is nothing short of miraculous. Amen. This is the outworking of the Holy Spirit enough to change a man from being a broken sinner into someone that the Lord is going to use. And she's in the crosshairs, right? She's right there. And, and to be honest, an unsaved person next to a saved person is going to feel very uncomfortable. Is that not true? Darkness has no fellowship with light, as the Bible says. So here... You know, as a bystander, we think then, let's, let's go back to uh, verse 4. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saw, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And again in verse 5, it says, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. What do you see there? Do you notice something interesting about that? Here's verse 4. So, so, why are you persecuting me? Why is Jesus saying that? He's not persecuting Jesus, is he? He's going after the followers of the way, right? Christians. Why is Jesus saying, whom you are persecuting? You might say, well, we're the church. We're his body, right? Would you say that? Yeah. Look at this. This is, we're in Isaiah this morning. Six, seven hundred years before Christ. And Isaiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes, In all their affliction, he was afflicted. Wow. Look at it in the NLT. It says, In all their suffering, he also suffered, and he personally rescued him. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. Wow. Does that not shed some light on the cry of our Lord when he says on the cross, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do? Amen. Is it because they didn't know Jesus and he had to say that? What about Stephen? Did Stephen not say the same thing? Falling to his knees when he was being stoned. 
cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Why do they say that? Why are they saying that? Is his love for his children so great that to hurt them is to hurt him? Wow. Look at this from Zechariah. For thus said the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. It's talking about the nation, those who come against the Israeli nation. But don't forget, we are Israel. Paul makes that clear in the New Testament, right? We become Israel, true Israel. Not just by birth, but by spiritual birth. Isn't that amazing? Does that not illuminate the depth of God's love for those that belong to Him? Wow. We are precious to Him. Just like a parent, if you see your child suffer, it breaks your heart too, right? You can't help it. Sometimes we need to remember that, that we are God's children. And when things go wrong for us, God grieves for us, especially when we are being persecuted for righteousness' sake. Wow. See, in the end, there are just two roads. One of them leads to destruction and one leads to everlasting life. God. If you don't follow the Lord, what will it take for you to actually stop? What will be your, if you don't know the Lord, what will be your Damascus road?